is Tim Sandifer, and I'm a lawyer. I sue the government for a living. Best job in the world. I would do it for free if I had to. And in fact, I do do it for free. I work for the Pacific Legal Foundation, a nonprofit uh, legal organization headquartered in Sacramento which is devoted to defending uh, individual rights, economic liberty, private property rights, uh, sensible environmental policy, racial equality, and so forth in the courts across this country. The Pacific Legal Foundation is also the most active organization in the country devoted to opposing Obamacare in the courts. We have filed uh, more than 10 briefs in courts in, I believe, five or six courts now in uh, all sorts of different cases on all sorts of different issues because the individual mandate is not the only issue involved in these cases. And we represent um, Matt Sissel, an individual who uh, lives in Iowa. He's a decorated Iraq War veteran and an artist. He's actually quite a talented artist. And he decided to open up a, an art studio where he does portraits um, that actually look like people. <laughs> He's a young artist, but his drawings, you can understand what they are. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, because the federal government has decided to force him to buy health insurance he doesn't need, he's having to take money away from his small business dream that was supposed to provide for him and his family as he saw fit and devoted to buying health insurance because the federal government thinks that he should have it. Now, as you know, the issue before the U.S. Supreme Court right now is whether or not it is constitutional. For the federal government to force you to buy a product or service, whether or not you want to, because government thinks it would be a good idea. <clears throat> now, the, the, why are they actually forcing you to buy the insurance? This is a point of dispute. The actual answer is to subsidize insurance companies that are forced against their will to insure people who are already sick. I think it needs to be emphasized that it is unjust for the federal government to force insurance companies to provide insurance for people whether, against their will. People have the right to freedom of contract, and insurance companies have the right not to make an agreement with somebody if they don't want to. The problem here is that the federal government forced insurance companies to insure sick people, which makes no more sense than forcing fire insurance companies to insure people whose homes are already on fire. <laughs> and then because that costs so much money, decided to subsidize the insurance companies by forcing you to buy their product, whether you want to or not. But the government's position is, oh no, that's not what we're doing. No, all we're doing here is we're forcing people to pay ahead of time for the health care that they're going to eventually receive. We all need health care at some point, so the government's just saying that you have to pay for it now instead of later. The problem with that, just as a practical matter, is that's not true. Uh, you are not required to use the insurance that you buy when you go to the doctor. In theory, under this law, you can still pay with cash, right? Um, and you have to get uh, you have to get coverage. You have to, have to get health insurance coverage for for things you'll never need or are extremely unlikely to need. And most importantly, the insurance purchase requirement doesn't apply to those people who are most likely to obtain health care without paying for it. It doesn't apply to the indigent or illegal immigrants who are the most likely people to obtain doctor coverage without having anything to pay for it. So, so much for the Obama administration's claim that all it's doing is requiring you to pay ahead of time for insurance that is there for health care that you're going to need. But aside from that, the question is before the court is whether this is constitutional. Now, I'm sure you all brought your constitutions with you, so if you'll take those out. It's always a dangerous joke with a crowd like this, because some of you probably do have a I always bring my handy iPhone constitution app. Very handy in court. Just whip this out and I just, where is the, the constitution? Just go up a second. The Constitution of the United States allows Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. And that is the clause under which the federal government claims authority to force you to engage in commerce. I'm not making that phrase up. That is the phrase that Justice Breyer used in the oral argument in this case. He said that the Commerce Clause allows government not just to regulate commerce, but to create commerce, to force you to engage in commerce. Now, 
For one thing, here's how you think like a lawyer, like a good lawyer. Read the text. The text says, regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, if the phrase regulate means the power to force you to buy something, that means we have the power to force foreign nations and Indian tribes to buy things, too. To remedy the trade imbalance by using federal power to force Japan to buy our cars, right? In this age of bailouts, why not? Now, we all know that the phrase to regulate commerce does not mean the right to force people to engage in economic activity whenever the government thinks it's a good idea. We know this because the word regulate does not mean compel. It means to regulate. To regulate means to govern activity that is voluntarily undertaken. Right? The word regulator, during the time that the Constitution was being written, the engineer James Watt was perfecting his steam engine. And he had a device on his steam engine called a regulator or a governor. And the regulator is a device that's got two metal balls on it, and it spins around as steam is escaping from the engine. And if the balls fall down because the thing is spinning too slowly, that means the pressure is falling, and it speeds up the heat. It makes it, more, it, makes it hotter, increases the pressure inside the engine. Whereas if, the, if they're going too fast and they start going, then that means there's too much pressure, and the, and the device slows down. It decreases the heat so that it's, it decreases the amount of pressure in the tank. It regulates the activity. It doesn't create the activity. It regulates or governs the activity that people engage in voluntarily. That's what regulate means. And we also know that the Founding Fathers knew the difference between regulating and compelling. We know this because when they decided to allow government to force you to do stuff, they used different words. Right? The Constitution also allows Congress to raise an army, to arm the militia. Right? To raise an army means in powers including the military draft to force you into the army, whether you want to or not. Right? The power to arm the militia was used early on in American history to pass a bill forcing members of the militia to buy firearms. Right? To raise, to arm, these are words that are very different than the term regulate. Commerce, what does the word commerce mean? If you don't buy insurance, are you engaged in commerce? <laughs> not buying insurance is not commerce. It's not anything. It's no more commerce than it is a pigeon or Tuesday problem. <laughs> It's nothing. It is totally arbitrary to describe it as something. And yet, under the government's interpretation, not buying insurance is commerce because it has an economic effect in the long run. A federal court in Michigan held that this law is constitutional on the grounds that mental processes that have an ultimate effect on supply and demand in the marketplace can be regulated by the federal government. <laughs> Now, of course, I need not tell this audience that absolutely everything has some effect on supply and demand in the, in the market, right? I mean, it's the, it's, the, it's the butterfly flapping its wings creating a storm in China argument, right? It's, it's the, the little old lady swallowed the fly. To, that's that sort of chain of causation. You can prove anything affects commerce under that theory, and that's why we say if the government can force you to buy insurance, it can also force you to buy broccoli, or buy automobiles from government-owned General Motors in order to boost the economy, and so forth. Now, these are all common sense arguments, which means they only go so far in court of law. <laughs> <laughs> the English writer Jonathan Swift said in Gulliver's Travels, lawyers are convinced that whatever has been done once may lawfully be done again. And so they are careful to keep records of every offense against reason and common sense in the history of man. That's called precedent. So what is the precedent? What is the precedent? Katzenbeck versus McClung in the 1960s, the court said that interstate commerce was shown when a restaurant purchased a certain fraction of its meat products from a company headquartered in another state. Even though the, this restaurant didn't do business with, with out-of-state customers or anything like that, some of its meat products were purchased from a company headquartered out-of-state. Therefore, it was engaged in interstate commerce. Uh, in the 1937 case of Jones and Laughlin Steel Corporation, the court said that the government could uh, pass the National Labor Relations Act because, in the long run, labor unrest affects the national economy. Therefore, the federal government can 
can set regulations for how every employer in the country hires and, and relates to employees. Those, that decision and other decisions like it during the New Deal era dramatically expanded federal power under the Commerce Clause to the point where today the federal government dictates everything from the thickness of ketchup to the angle of the chairs in your office place. And of course, you all know Wickard versus Filbert, right? Yeah. This is amazing. I love this. I, Ten years ago, if you had told me that I could speak to an audience and they would have heard of Wickard versus Filbert, <laughs> But they've all heard of it. This is the case from 1940 in which the Supreme Court said that the federal government could regulate Farmer Filburn's uh, uh, growing of wheat on his property for his own farm's consumption. Because if he didn't grow the wheat, he would have to buy it, which means that it would affect the, the national economy, and therefore it affected the economy, and therefore the federal government could regulate it. That's the body of precedent we have. Precedent is very bad for us for those of us who believe this law is unconstitutional. There are really only two cases in recent memory, actually there are really only two cases since the New Deal in which the Supreme Court has struck down federal laws as going too far under the Commerce Clause. There's a case called Lopez and a case called Morrison, and, and they were sort of from 10 and 15 years ago. In Lopez, the court was uh, addressing the Gun-Free School Zones Act. This was a federal law that prohibited the possession of firearms within a certain distance of a school. Alfonso Lopez was arrested for possessing a firearm near a school, and he was brought up on charges, and he said, where in the Constitution does it, says, does it say that Congress can regulate the possession of firearms near a school? And the argument, now, I am not making this up. The argument was, well, you see, the kids of tomorrow, or kids of today will lead the commerce of tomorrow. And in order to do a good job of it, they're going to have to have a good education. And that means they're going to have to go to schools where there aren't any guns around. Therefore, prohibiting the possession of guns regulates interstate commerce. Like I said, I'm not making that up. The Supreme Court said, five to four, eh, that's a little too much for us. And they struck that law down. Five years later, in Morrison, the Supreme Court struck down the Violence Against Women Act, which was a federal law that, among other things, allowed women to sue their rapists in federal court. And then the question was, what does this have to do with commerce? And again, they said, well, you see, the women of today are going to lead the commerce of tomorrow, and to do a good job of it, they're going to have to not be subject to violent sexual attacks. And the Supreme Court said, this is a garden variety crime that is already illegal in all of the states. The Constitution leads this matter to the states. It's not a regulation of interstate commerce. Therefore, it's unconstitutional. And they said, we begin with first principles. The Constitution creates a government of limited, enumerated powers. Now that, that is a principle that is plain to every fair reader of the Constitution of the United States. You have to go to America's top law schools for several years in order to misunderstand <laughs> It's a four-page document that was written for you and me. It was not written as esoteric instructions to an enlightened minority. And what it says, in Article I, Section 1 of the Constitution, it says, all legislative powers herein granted are vested in the Congress of the United States. It does not say all power. It does not even say all legislative power is vested in Congress. It says all legislative powers herein granted are vested in Congress. And then it goes on to grant them. And it lists them, Article I, Section 8, and a few other places. And if you can't find it in Articles 1, Section 8, Congress cannot do it. And if you look in Article I, Section 8, it does not say provide health care to anybody who wants it. Now, I went to the Supreme Court in March to attend the three days of oral arguments in the Obamacare cases. I sat in line for 10 hours uh, on, the, on the second day, eight hours on the first day, and most people were dead by the third day, so it was <laughs> five or six hours on the third day. I stood in the line in 32 degree weather, so you didn't have to. And, uh, <laughs> I think it was a little unfair. A lot of people were picking on Solicitor General 
Donald Verrilli for his performance in the oral argument. I didn't really think that was fair. I thought that he did a, as good a job as a person could do with a lousy constitutional argument. If you heard, and you can hear these, you can get them online. There's a website called the Oye Project, O-Y-E-Z, the Oye Project. And if you go there, you can listen to the oral arguments of just about any Supreme Court case that you want. It's really neat to listen to these. Um, and if you listened to the uh, Arizona case, the uh, SB 1070 case that was argued a few weeks ago, um, once again, you saw how the Obama administration really has no familiarity with the Constitution of the United States. Um, and what Solicitor General Verrilli argued, uh, the highlight for me, I think, on the, on the day of the individual mandate argument was when somebody said, when, when Chief Justice Roberts said, can the federal government force people to buy cell phones? Because after all, you might be in a car accident or you know, be out hiking and get lost or something, and you, know, and you might need help. And, you know, the, and, and God knows it, it costs people money to send out search and rescue teams for you or send paramedics or whatever. So maybe the federal government can regulate commerce by forcing everybody to buy a cell phone. And Solicitor General Varelli, Varelli said, no, no, of course not. The health insurance industry is very unique. It's different than cell phones because everybody needs health care at some point in their lives. And cell phones, it's not quite that way. You, know, you can choose whether to have a cell phone or not. Okay, later on in the oral argument, they were talking about cost shifting, which is the, the Obama administration's term for people who get health healthcare without paying for it so that you and I are forced to pay for it. And, uh, and he said, well, it, it, cost shifting occurs all the time. Uh, in, in, in your telephone bill, for example, when you pay your telephone bill, a lot of time you're subsidizing other people who live in more distant places whose telephone services cost more. And Justice Scalia leaned forward and said, well, yeah, but we don't force them to buy cell phones. And as, as Solicitor General Verley said, well, in today's society, you can't afford not to have a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Look it up if you don't believe me. He said. This is why I can't be a Supreme Court justice. I would go, aha! <laughs> Our side is not asking for a lot in these cases. We are not asking, as the administration and its supporters would claim, for a dramatic rewriting of American Constitution law. On the contrary, we're asking for the court simply to stick to what it's already said. Yeah, the government can do anything it wants when it's regulating the economy, but it can't go the next step and force you to engage in a, in a commercial agreement and buy something you don't want. That's all we're saying. It's not an extreme position. In fact, it's the least extreme position I have ever taken. <laughs> and I left the court pretty optimistic about how that's going to go. I think the argument went very well for our side. I think it was very clear that if the court is going to uphold this mandate, they're going to see it as a dramatic step away from what the Founding Fathers thought, away from a document that gives the federal government limited enumerated powers. The question is, are they prepared to take that step? Four of the justices clearly are. Certainly Justice Breyer, who said during the oral argument that he thinks that the federal government can create commerce under the Constitution. My copy of the Constitution doesn't have that word, but that's what he said. Now that's only one issue. That's the main, that's the main attraction in the Obamacare cases. But there's some other very interesting issues involved in these cases. To me, as a Constitution nerd, one of my, one of my uh, one of the cases I'm interested in is the question about whether states even can sue in the first place. As you know, this case, more than half of the states are plaintiffs challenging the constitutionality of this law. So then the question is, can the states even sue in the first place? You may know a lot of states pass laws called, uh, the, called Health Care Freedom Acts. That, for instance, Virginia passed a law, the Health Care Freedom Act, that says no person shall be compelled to buy health insurance. So then they filed, the Virginia filed the lawsuit and said, we think that the federal mandate violates the Health Care Freedom Act. We would like the federal court to tell us which one is constitutional. And the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals said, no, nope, states can't do that. States cannot sue to defend the constitutionality of their own laws in this way. <laughs> Instead, what the state has to do in order to sue, the state has to show that it's been injured on its own. Now, Virginia says, yeah, we have been injured. We are a state. We passed a law. We've exercised our sovereign power, power that is reserved to us under the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. So we have that right, we have the right to defend our rights in court 
in a lawful process. I mean, we're not seceding or anything. We're just saying we want the court to pronounce which one is constitutional. Now, of course, the federal, the Supreme Court has, has, you know, is not going to hear that case because it's still considering the Florida cases. But that question depends on an old 1920s case called Massachusetts versus Mellon. And in that case, what happened was that the state of Massachusetts sued the federal government for running an unconstitutional program in what lawyers love to use Latin. I took Greek in college. <laughs> totally useless. <laughs> when I talk to doctors, I can understand what they're saying. When I read law, I have to get out the Latin to English dictionary. Uh, lawyers love to use the phrase, the Latin phrase is parents patriae. Is, uh, is the phrase here. And what that means is, uh, like a parent, like a political parent, like the father of your country, you know. The, the state is protecting its citizens, it's acting parents patriae. And in Massachusetts versus Mellon, the Supreme Court said states don't act as parents patriae when suing the federal government. They can't, they're not allowed to do it. Now the problem with that is, that's carte blanche for the federal government to override its constitutional limits. Right? The states were designed by the Founding Fathers to provide security against federal overreaching. The Federalist Papers, and I know you've all read the Federalist Papers, <laughs> the Federalist Papers say that America, that Madison called it a compound republic. America is a compound republic in which power is divided among the states and the federal government, and then each one is separated into branches and so forth in order to create gridlock. The Founding Fathers' greatest invention was gridlock. <laughs> anyway, they separated these, the states out from the federal government in this way in order that they balance and, and, and hold tension against each other in order to protect our freedoms. So, of course, states should be allowed to pass laws like the Health Care Freedom Act. This isn't nullification or secession or nonsense like that. This is just the state exercising its Tenth Amendment reserved powers to enforce its own laws and to protect that right in court. And interestingly, you might remember that Massachusetts case some years ago where Massachusetts sued the federal government to force the, the EPA to regulate greenhouse gases? Massachusetts versus EPA? The Supreme Court said, yeah, states can act as parents patriae when they're forcing the federal government to comply with federal law. Well, the Constitution of the United States is federal law. And states should therefore be allowed to enforce its protections. Another issue that's before the court is this Medicaid expansion issue. This took up the third day of the oral arguments, and it was fascinating. In fact, it was such an interesting argument. This is a total shoot-the-moon argument in terms of the precedent. Because the precedent, again, is really bad for our side. But the court was so interested in the argument that they extended the argument time, almost doubled it the argument was so interesting. And the question in that part of the case is, the, the, the Obamacare statute requires states to sign up people for Medicaid, who otherwise would not have been eligible, expands the eligibility requirement and forces states to sign people up. And if they don't comply, they lose all of the Medicaid money that they get from the federal government, which is, for some states, 40 or 50 percent of the entire state budget. Now, the federal government has never done this before. They've, sometimes they've changed the Medicaid program a little bit, and they've said, OK, we'll give you 10% more money if you do such and such. And the states can say no, and then they don't get that 10% extra. Of course, they always say yes, because they always want the money, right? Yeah. But now the government has come along and said, you have to change your, in, this program, and if you don't, you lose the money for everything. <clears throat> now, we know from the cases, there's cases that have said over and over again, the federal government can't force the states to do stuff. But they can. Uh, bargain with, negotiate with states, and say, we'll give you money if you do such and such. Okay? Now the question is, when does bargaining become compulsion? And there's only two cases ever on this in American history. There was an old case called Butler from the 1930s, where the court said, you know, sometimes bargaining would turn into compulsion. It's not very helpful. And there was a case called Dole, South Dakota versus Dole in 1987. And what happened in that case was, the federal government said, to the states. If you want some extra highway repair money, you have to change your drinking age to 21. Okay. And the state filed a lawsuit and said, you know, we don't think they can do that. We don't think they, that, the, that the federal government can come to us and offer us money to exercise our sovereign powers in the way that the feds want. And the Supreme Court said, no, they can do that. 
because it's not very much money in this case. True, I mean, it really wasn't, I mean, really, it wasn't. It was something like four million bucks or something that, that relative to the federal outlays, it really was a small amount. It's like 7% of the state's highway funding or something like that. So it really was not a lot of money. And Chief Justice Rehnquist said, so we don't think it rises to the level of compulsion, but someday it might. Well, if there's ever a case that rises to the level of compulsion, it's this one. We're talking about, again, half of the state's entire budget. And it's not like if a state were to say no, they don't have to send their taxes to Washington, right? They still lose all their money to go to other states that have said yes. What's really going on here is that the federal government is coming and saying, your money or your life, and when, they, when, when the state hands over the money to the federal government, the government then turns around and says, okay, I'll give you half this money back if you do what I say. That's what's going on. And if the states say no, they still have to give up their money to Washington, D.C. How is that a fair bargain or negotiation or agreement? That's not. That's compelling the states in a way the founding fathers did not intend. Now, because there's so limited, there's so few cases on this issue, if the court were to decide this issue, they really would be, they'd be stepping out into uncharted territory as far as the Supreme Court is concerned. Maybe they'll do that. They've done that before in recent years, right? The Second Amendment case was uncharted territory when it took that route. So maybe they will decide that. I think it more likely that what they're going to do is they're going to strike down the individual mandate and then strike down all of the statute, right? That's another question is whether to strike out the whole thing or just part of it. And then they won't get to this issue. But the argument went very well. And I think it's possible that we might get a good decision on this question to limit the power of the feds to twist the arms of states and basically compel them to do what the feds say they ought to do. What I thought was most interesting about that argument was at the very end, because it was the last day, it was the third day, we were all so exhausted that everything seemed hilarious to us. I mean, it was really something. And um, you see, you have to stand in line outside the court. They don't open the door for lawyers. They don't open the door until 7. Then you have to stand in another line until, until 10 when you get to go into the courtroom and finally sit down. You're not allowed to sit down inside the Supreme Court building. So I got there at midnight uh, in order to be, in order to have a place in line. I was eighth in line. And uh, and I think, don't, forget, don't really remember now. Anyway, there's a lot I don't remember about this, dude. <laughs> um, on the, on the, at the very end, on the third and final day, Solicitor General Verrilli gets up and he says, you know, I want the court to remember that when we passed this law, we were trying to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Which, of course, is one of the lines in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution. Well, that totally opened the door for Paul Clement, who was arguing the case for our side, who stood up and said, you know, it's a funny definition of the word liberty that forces people to buy insurance that they don't want because the government thinks they ought to. And it's a funny definition of federalism that allows the federal government to force states to sign people up for Medicaid that they're going to have to pay for on pain of losing half of their entire state budget. I don't know why the Solicitor General thought it was good to, <laughs> to open himself up to that, to that charge, but I thought it really ended the argument in a, on a beautiful note and, uh, and left us all beaming about how that case went. I think we might win that case, but it's on the outside. There's another issue, however, that's not before the Supreme Court I'd like to talk briefly about, and that is, a case, that is an issue that's pending in a case in Arizona right now that I've also participated in. And this case involves something called the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Have you heard of this? Yeah. It's on the cover of National Review last year, I think. And this is an agency created by Obamacare. It's, it's a, a, an agency of unelected and appointed bureaucrats who will write recommendations for how the federal government will pay its bills for health care and it has a mandate to lower aggregate Medicare expenditures. Okay. Now, what's interesting is when you delve a little bit more, their recommendations become law with no congressional or presidential activity. They write these regulations and they automatically become law. Not only that, but Congress is specifically prohibited from altering these recommendations. Unless, of course, they, Congress passes a law that reduces Medicare expenditures even more than this board does. So this board is an autonomous entity that writes rules that automatically become law regardless.
regardless of what the president, Congress, or the courts do. And the statute is exempted, specifically exempted from any judicial review, any congressional review, any presidential review. And it's made unrepealable. The statute says you cannot repeal this ICAB agency unless the following occurs. Let's see if I get this right, or my, my wife, who's also litigating the case, is going to get on me if I get this wrong. Um, you have to pass, Congress has to pass a joint resolution that must be introduced after January 3rd and before February 1st, 2017. That joint resolution must be titled, and it lists the specific title of the joint resolution, and it must pass by a vote of two-thirds of all elected congressmen, which is the most severe supermajority requirement in the history of American law. Every other, even, even the Constitution only requires a two-thirds majority of present congressmen. But this statute requires all elect, so you're a no vote if you're out of town, right? So this statute is made basically unrepealable. Now, you've heard the phrase death panels, and that's, that is kind of silly because these people will not be regulating care. They'll be regulating expenditures. They'll be setting the rules that say, no, doctors can't provide this because they won't get any money. And this is an unelected agency purposely insulated from any kind of presidential, congressional, or judicial control. One of the most prominent defenders of this law, of, of, of Obamacare, is a law professor named Timothy Jost. Professor Jost wrote an article last year in which he praised this provision, this IPAD agency, by calling it a group of platonic guardians. <laughs> now, I couldn't resist pointing out in my brief that if you've read The Republic, you know that Plato's guardians are charged, among other things, with regulating the practice of medicine in his communist utopia, where they will, among other things, choose who is fit to live and die. And you might know from your reading that the Founding Fathers hated Plato. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson and John Adams corresponded about him in their retirement. Jefferson said that he thought that, that Plato, that thousands of volumes had never explained Plato because nonsense can never be explained. <laughs> John Adams wrote back and he said that he, he thought Plato was puerile and, and terrible, and that the only thing he ever learned from Plato was that you could cure hiccups with a pinch of snuff. <laughs> so I had to put that in the brief. <laughs> that case, that's uh, that case called Cocoons versus Geithner, that case is still waiting in the trial court. The courts have all just said, we're going to we're going to wait and see what the Supreme Court does. So our case, on behalf of Matt Sissel, which is pending in the Washington, D.C. federal trial court, that case is also on hold until we hear what the Supreme Court's going to do. And they're going to decide this month. You can expect a decision on or before June 28th. I mean, there's an outside chance that they could hold it over past that, but they probably almost certainly will not do so. What do we do if we win this case? Now, as I said, the individual mandate provision of the case is really not a very extreme argument. We're not asking for any kind of rewriting of the, of the, of the case law. We may think that Wickard versus Filburn was stupid, but you don't have to overrule Wickard versus Filburn to rule in our favor, because even Wickard didn't say you could force people to buy insurance, right? It didn't say you could force people to do things at all. It just regulated how they do things. So if we were to win this case, it really doesn't change constitutional law a great deal. It does say that there are outside limits to the commerce power, which is something that, shockingly enough, is a surprise to a lot of professors. <laughs> the idea that the federal government only has a certain limited short list of enumerated powers is old-fashioned thinking from a bygone era in their progressive outlook. So, it, it, will, it will be shocking and horrifying, and maybe it won't be the end of the world. You're a bunch of chicken little screaming that. But what should be the next step after that? Well, I'm not an expert on health insurance or health care statutes or health care regulations or, or the markets or whatever, but I do know one thing. On my way down here, I had a long drive. I stopped at a Del Taco. I'm addicted to Del Taco. I love Del Taco. <laughs> and whenever I want Del Taco, I can get it. I can get it cheap, and I can get it good. And I can get it just about anywhere I want. Why? Because I'm paying for it. And if I don't get what I want, I'll go to Taco Bell. And there are 5,000 Taco Bells. Right? I can get out my iPhone and look up a Taco Bell, be there in five minutes, and have a delicious chicken burrito.
know in my hands in two minutes that will be nourishing, satisfying, safe, and cheap. Why? Because the federal government doesn't run Taco Bell. <laughs> Why would you ever think that you can trust the government with your health care? 